change. Um, this morning we will have uh, a speech by uh, the Alternative Nobel Prize uh, winner, Nimo Bese from uh, Nigeria. Uh, uh, this will be followed by a, a speech by um, uh, Wolfram, Dr. Wolfram Lauber, who is a senior researcher uh, here at CEF, working in the um, Department of Political and Cultural Change, the so-called CEF A. Uh, happy to have you here in uh, our uh, small conference room. We, all, we also welcome uh, representatives from the Right Livelihood Foundation, Ole from Uxkul. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, and also Sharan Srinavas, who is with us the whole week here in our workshop. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open. May I also introduce to you uh, Dr. Papa So. Uh, he's also senior researcher here at CEF, and he'll uh, kindly agree to moderate the whole session here this morning. Thank you. Okay, right. Um, then um, I think uh, uh, to have introduced the first speaker already. Um, so uh, Mr. Nemo Basse is going to talk about uh, the presentation title, A Movement is Not a Bicycle Wheel, and then Dr. Wolfram Lowe will talk about fighting for a market limited scope for social mobilization among small scale farmers in northern uh, so I think we can start for that floor. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, <laughs> good morning brothers and sisters. Good morning, friends. Good morning, in laws and outlaws. <laughs> Okay, um, I should thank the Right Life Road Award Foundation for this very important uh, series of workshops and also for our host for hosting us so beautifully. I deliberately chose the, this topic to make you wonder what it's all about. The movement is not a bicycle wheel. A bicycle wheel is just a part of a bicycle and I was discussed with my friend, Charlie said, of course you can have all the bicycle wheels you like, but if you don't ride the bicycle, it's not going to go anywhere. So we'll be looking at this as a metaphor, and in the conclusion, I'll be emphasizing the fact that the driving force behind a movement is movement itself. And so if you're not moving, there's no movement. And if you are moving, you should be glad that you are moving and something is happening. There are many questions that come up when you are involved in movement building. And sometimes you don't grasp the basic concept of what and purpose of movement. You can easily get, um, you can easily believe that you've not really achieved anything. Because in a social movement, sometimes it's very difficult to mark the milestones of what you've achieved and where you're going and where you're going to end. So we're going to look at all this, and I'll be as quick as I can be. So when you, when you look at a bicycle wheel, the, the basic, most simple bicycle wheel is the outer rim, and then the inner hub. And some conventional bicycles have spokes, you know, connecting the two. But when I look at the movement, I don't look at the spokes. I say movement as having a hub of leaders, and then the outer rim, encompassing everyone in the movement, and then there's no distinction between the leaders and the people. So a movement doesn't have heroes standing out or have people who are the icons and, you know, without whom nothing will happen. If a movement is dependent on one leader or two leaders, it's very easy to take that movement out. Because once you knock those leaders out, then the movement fizzles out. People are the catalyst in any movement situation. And uh, you know, when I, when I see engineers, I think the best engineers in the world are the engineers who make things happen, who make, who make changes in human society, the way we look at things, the way we respond to things, the way we do things. Not, engineering is not just a mechanical thing. And so, of course, you have social engineering, you have engineers of human ideas and movements and human souls. 
And in catalyzing a movement, people come together and are bound together by ideas, desires, and they generally rub on each other as, as they go on. But the critical thing that makes movement happen is the fact that there must be something that people are objecting to, something that people feel bad about, something that is creating pain, grief, something that is totally wrong that needs to be changed. Once you can lay your hand on this, and it could be spontaneous, not something you have to dream about, and it's been happening over and over. A movement begins not because somebody sat down somewhere to think, oh, I'm going to start a movement on this or that, but because people are feeling something. Something is wrong, something is wrong, and something must be done. And people don't just want to talk about it, they want to do something about it. And then suddenly, you find people on the streets. In January this year, in Nigeria, January, 1st January, we, before then, we have been thinking that because of a series of campaigns against the military, people were tired of protests. People were afraid to come on the streets. But on New Year's Eve, the government announced measures that affected everybody. When I say everybody, I mean everybody, not, not, not those who are benefiting from the corrupt system. And so before anybody could say anything, the streets were filled with <coughs> thousands of people, over 40 cities across the nation. People were up and they were ready to press on. And they did press on, on the demands that they had. That was not planned at all. It was spontaneous. But it was something that happened that affected everybody. So a movement can be triggered off at a, without any moment's notice. Which requires that we must be attentive to what is going around us. There was a time when you asked me, how, is, how are you doing? I said, no problem. But I don't say that anymore. How are things? Good, great. I hardly give those kind of answers anymore. Or, how are you doing? So I'm not complaining. Why are you not complaining? If you are not complaining, it means there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're okay. It actually means you are not attentive to what is going on around you. So there are challenges that make us rise up, brings us together. And one of the biggest challenges is the way the planet is being trashed. And the trash of the environment, of the, the, of the planet, has many dimensions, economic, social, political, spiritual. The planet is being treated by humans, as we heard yesterday, as if we are not part of Mother Earth. As if we own the earth, we own the planet. And a lot of money is invested to see how we could go to other planets. And a few weeks ago, there was a cover story on Newsweek saying that astronomers think that there are other universes, many universes, beyond the one we live in. Now, we can't even think of going to live on another planet. We're already looking for other universes. And so even if it were possible to go to Mars or Venus and live there, only very few people can make it. How many lifetimes to travel there? Which means that what we have is so precious that we must put in all that we can to preserve it in a way that's recognizable and that can sustain all life forms. We, we like to think that we're the highest life form on Earth, but I think it's just it's a, it's a measure of our ignorance to think that way. But the other life forms are not telling us what they think about us. We think that, well, the domination has become the thing. We can dominate, we can change, we can destroy, so we are the best. But I don't think that's the measure of how good you are. The fact that you are the most, you, the most capable to destroy. You can wage war against everybody, nobody asks a question. That doesn't mean you are powerful. It may mean you are a bully. So the crisis we have today are templates that gives us hooks on which you can build social movements, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, the food crisis, climate energy, the false solutions to the crisis that is, lead, that is speeding up more crisis, the false solutions to climate change led to development or promotion of agrofuels, and this is generating even more problems with climate change direct dimensions, and also uh, causing a lot of land grabs years of institutions like the Food Agricultural Organization of the UN, 
keep on peddling the fiction that plantations are forests. How many of you know that plantations are forests? Nobody knows. Are plantations forests? Can you please answer me? Are plantations forests? <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> of course they are not. One million trees of the same species cannot make a forest. A forest is a complex of different species of forest cover, shrubs, and plantations are sterile, things that you can spray. You can spray chemicals and use herbicides, have genetically engineered trees, have no butterflies, no birds, and still call it a plantation, but that's not a forest. A forest is a living organism. So the, the major reason why solutions to the, the I'm getting too fast. The solution the problems that we have today is because mankind's thinking and our political institutions have been captured by, by corporations. <laughs> so corporate capture and the perversiveness of logos around the world has made us think that only the private sector or the corporate uh, transnational corporations, only these ones have solutions to our problems. So whatever they dream of to sustain their profit is accepted by politicians as a solution. This is why Rio Plus 20 is about green economy. Green economy. Not green environment. Green business. And so every business is green itself. But green is no longer a color. And green is not green. Well, I'm just, I'm just throwing things to you to think about. So don't expect me to give all the answers. And the crisis in the world can be tied to the addiction to, to fossil fuels, coal, crude oil, gas. And now we're having more extreme extract, extractions as crude oil is depleted. Because not, the moment crude, the first barrel of crude oil was extracted, it became a finishing resource because it's not renewable and it's not in millions of years. And so we, the addiction to fossil fuel, endless growth, endless consumption, and the so-called cheap energy is driving us to the brink. And this is, these are impetus for us to rise up, build movements, to resist this blind drive down the cliff that is bound to destroy civilization as we know it. You just need to think about those monuments in Latin America, the monuments in Egypt, the pyramids, all the ziggurats, and all those, the ones that were in, the, in Afghanistan or Iraq before they were blown up by the Taliban, those big giant structures. And you wonder, who built these things? Why did they build them? Why didn't that mode of civilization continue? It's just what exactly what we're doing now. We are exhausting the resources that we have believing that we can eat our cake and have it. And suddenly, cataclysm. And our children's children come tomorrow and they see all these skyscrapers and they wonder, what kind of people were these? Why did they build so high? From their stories. What are these machines? What are these machines or what? You know, we're just giving them problems on how to, to understand what kind of people we were who destroyed the planet on which we live. Now, I just threw this in to, to just give you a sense of why I do what I do. Because I believe clearly that pollution is political. Because you look at any place at all in the world, pollution, the rich areas are not polluted. It's always the, the poor sections of cities, of, of, of states or regions. And this man, Lawrence Summers, who was uh, in the World Bank by this time, when he wrote this email to a colleague, uh, he said it made economic sense to dump toxic waste in the lowest wage countries. This is impeccable. Impeccable. And he said he always thought that the underpopulated countries in Africa are very underpolluted. This is one of Obama's advisors in recent times. And he almost made it to become the head of the World Bank because he wasn't nominated for that. But there were rumors that he was being considered. Now, what he meant by this. He said university, remember? <laughs> exactly. It's like, what, what this guy said here, what he meant by this was that in a country where life expectancy is about maybe 40, 50 years, if you kill them off, 
doesn't make any difference. And it's better to let them die off because they will not live to 50 or 60. But when you have a country where people live up to 80, 90, then if you kill them, you are, if, you, if you cut short their life, then you are really doing something bad. So if you kill Africans because they're not going to live to any length of time, you're just doing, that's nothing, no impact at all. So dump the toxic waste there. So pollution is not something that happens accidentally. It's conscious, it's planned, it's sold as a good idea, it makes business idea, and it makes us look at pollution or polluting incidents or activities with a different perspective. So that when you're fighting against pollution or polluting entities, that you know that you are really fighting a battle that goes beyond just dumping something somewhere, but there's a basic idea that is guiding this kind of destructive activity. This cartoon summarizes it all. <coughs> South Africa thought they had apartheid, but that was better material. Now we have the global apartheid. And my friend from Palestine will say the apartheid war is just one of those amateurish things that people do. They build a big wall at the border with Egypt, between Egypt and Israel, to stop immigrants from going across. All these are amateurish. amateurish. The wall at the border between Mexico and uh, the United States, these are small things. The, the big, big things are happening in the systemic way of design <coughs> capitalism. So a movement must have a goal, and this goal, the basic overarching goal I've seen in a movement, it must be justice. If justice is not, if the aim is not to ensure justice, then we lose a lot. And this is what is wrong with many of the multilateral discussions we're having in the world. So the climate change discussion is failing because justice is being denied. The Rio Plus 20 will be a flop because also justice is being denied. And one of the key principles of justice in the Rio principle is the common but differentiated responsibilities. Now, somebody said, well, what we achieved in Durban was that we demolish division, differences between countries. You cannot do that. There's history behind what has been going on in the world. It's a history. Pollution has a history. The atmosphere has been colonized historically, and this cannot be denied today. And those historical wrongs have to be addressed. And I like Che Guevara because one of the quotations said that we must be reasonable and demand the impossible. I love it. I don't like making reasonable demands. Because when you make reasonable demands, it means you have limited thinking. When you demand what people say is impossible, it means you've, got the, you've touched the nerve of what really is possible and must be done. So we do not, don't just demand what you can achieve tomorrow. A movement is built on a dream that is bigger than all of us. Not what can be attained tomorrow. If it can be achieved tomorrow, I don't need to bother about it. Go to sleep. Somebody's going to do it. But if it's something that is really big and complicated and tough, then I know I cannot do it alone. And it's not going to be ended tomorrow. But I must do what I can do in my own lifetime. This is what inspires. Even setting up right life at work was not inspired by what could be done immediately. What people thought was didn't make sense. What people thought could not be done. This is what fires people to do things. I can see fire already on your heads. <laughs> so be reasonable, brothers and sisters, always demand the impossible. I like this quotation. It's not mine. It was made by a Saudi Arabian minister of foreign affairs. He said the crude oil age, the stone age did not end for lack of stones, and the crude oil age will not end for lack of crude oil. And so those who think that this will remain the major economic driver in the world for centuries, for, for decades to come, it's just a pipe dream. And we can't allow them to drive us to extinction. So number, point number five, that if you can see that the, these things are numbered, <laughs> the fifth point, a movement must be flexible. And what do, I mean, what do I mean by this? <clears throat> Flexibility is evolution of social movements. If you are rigid, most rigid structures collapse under pressure. But if you're flexible, without, without being whimsical, 
then of course you'll be able to remain in focus while adapting to changing situations seeing your strategies re rethinking the problems and challenges and then noticing the right spaces and right times to build linkages with others of like minds and those who can support the struggle so a movement tolerates many narratives what do I mean by this I think this is the most important point on this slide. A movement must tolerate many narratives. Uh, this is many times people ask me, you are an environmental justice campaigner, what have you achieved? Or when you've been campaigning for over two decades on the same issue, why have you not given up? My answer is that the most critical perspective in any campaign or struggle is to be able to say no to something. When we see a system that is going in the wrong direction, saying no to it is a major success. But when you say no to it, people say, okay, what is the alternative? The alternatives are everywhere. And there are many alternatives. So we, have, we can have one no, but a thousand yes. So the critical thing is to start with the no. No, we don't accept this. We don't want this. This cannot be this. And then we all build our narratives on what are the possibilities. And then we have a contest of ideas, a contest of um, strategies, and then a movement. The movement comes together and we begin to evolve. There are different ways to evolve in different contexts. The, the no maybe is one around the world, but our perspectives, our context will be different. And so we begin to tackle this differently. And I'll give an example at this point. One of the, one of the things I hope, I, 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 my, one of my, my unreasonable demands is to stop all production. My reasonable, unreasonable demand. To stop all extraction, crude oil extraction all over the world. And this is such a huge issue because many, for some countries, Access to crude oil has been equated to national security. So if you block a pipeline, you're inviting bombs and drones and other things. But something can be done immediately, maybe not globally, but from places. And if you look at the map of Africa, crude oil is found now and gas everywhere. There's hardly, you're looking for a country where there's no crude oil or gas now. And it's being found in very fragile ecosystems. See the pictures, the two of the pictures from East Africa? The oil is being drilled in a game reserve, game reserves. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen in the Abata Rift Valley area of Uganda where oil companies, they have, they have a small air strip in a game reserve. So when the light planes are coming, the workers will have to chase the animals so the plane could land. It's not sustainable because after a couple of years, all the animals will be gone, either killed by the oil workers or driven by poison. And the foot here, this man, uh, is the foot of a, the feet of a man. Uh, he, he had just stepped into a river that experienced oil. This picture was taken late last year, uh, 2011. And he stepped into a river that, was, that had oil spill in 2004. And the oil company Shell said they've cleaned that spill. This was years after he had cleaned the spill. He just left the water stepped out. You can still see the crude oil, so I don't need to. So we, in order to tackle this, what we're doing is to build community cells who bridge differences in perspective, in approaches, and are trained to monitor the environment, report on the harm being done, and put pressure on the corporations to change. They will not change to do things better, and then to stop oil from being extracted in their communities. And we're building cells already in Nigeria, over 20 communities already. We're building in Uganda, in Ghana, in the new oil fields. I was in Ghana about two weeks ago, in the new oil field areas, in also in Cameroon, and in South Africa, resisting coal mining and other destructive things that are affecting poor people in the communities. We already have successes of leaving the oil in the soil. We have the slogan, leave the oil in the soil, leave the coal in the hole. 
live, live the tassels in the land and leave the fracking gas in the grass. And we have successes in the Ogoni, Ogoni land in Nigeria since 1993. All no oil has been extracted in Ogoni land because of the struggle of the movement of the survival of Ogoni people. We are working with them to maintain the status quo. No, no new oil is going to be taken from Ogoni land, I can assure you. In the next how many years? It's not going to happen. Simply cannot happen. Because the spills there cannot be cleaned. The United Nations Environmental Program says it will take 30 years to clean the rivers of Ogoni and five years to clean the land. And they must clean the land first before cleaning the rivers. So it accumulated 35 years to restore Ogoni land. It's assessment of the United Nations. So if that is going to happen, they have to clean the land and clean the waters before they open up the oil wells. That means they require 35 years of deep investment. To start with, the UNF says $1 billion needed to set up the infrastructure to begin the cleanup. And we estimate that it's going to require hundreds of billions of dollars to restore just a small portion of the oil fields of Nigeria. So this business is deficit. It makes rich governments, but destroyed environments, and poor people. Now, I can, when I talk about oil, my, my blood begins to boil, so I, I need to move away from there. So a movement must be inclusive. We have to recognize that other movements elsewhere then to build connections. Leaving the oil in the soil, actually concrete, apart from the Goni, in Ecuador, at the Yasuni Park. Oil worth um, $720 million. Then the government said we will let go 50% of that if they can get the contribution from various countries and agencies and then leave the oil there. And that, that is a good concept although we don't fully agree with the reasoning behind it. In Lopoten, in Norway, through community act activist uh, campaigns, the oil drilling that has been deferred for at least three and a half years before government will revisit the idea. Why? Because the oil is found in the spawning grounds of corn, and the fishermen know that it's going to destroy the fisheries. So we have an example. In Nigeria, our campaign will produce a a document on the post petroleum of Nigeria is beginning to have seen governments begin to talk that way. But what we're saying, don't close all the orange with but don't open any new one. And this doesn't mean you're going to lose money. Our argument is economic and moral. For Nigeria to double its income from crude oil, you don't need to open new oil wells or pump more oil. You just have to stop the oil theft. And just last week, there was a publication that 56 illegal oil pumping points have been discovered, and most of them are owned by oil corporations. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Movements unite. It's one of the things we do by working with communities to make sure they don't have differences, that they, they, they see the commonalities of the struggle coming together. Uh, so even when a movement starts from a regional or ethnic perspective, it has to transcend that, otherwise the movement is going to be destroyed. A movement that is very parochial, that is parochial, that is hinged on uh, a small set of people that cannot include other people, cannot unite, but divides would not. And as, as was emphasized yesterday over and over by our world, movement must, must be transgenerational. The future doesn't belong to us. I tell my, when I go to the community, I say, well, I'm one of your ancestors now. But the young people have a future. They must stand to fight for their future. The older people are finished. They, they are finished. They are exhausted. There's nothing more for them to do. They just sit there and look at stories and look at things happen. But the young people have dreams, hopes. They're going to have families. Movement must have a character. We've seen examples of this. The apartheid movement had a very clear character. The civil rights movement in the United States, but had some other movements up and around. The farmers' movements led by the Labia Capesina and others. And, you know, you must be known about something. You must be, you must have a character that can be discerned, that can attract people to come to join that uh, movement. And in front of the Earth International, which I happen to chair and will be chairing for till the next couple of, the next four months or so, or six, next six months, we no longer see ourselves as an NGO, we see ourselves as part of a movement. It makes a very big mental shift. When you don't think of yourself as a non-governmental organization, 
which again we heard yesterday, I never thought about it that way. Being, being defined by what you are not is not very helpful. So also, I'd like to see myself as being a part of the uncivil society. <laughs> okay. Men with character, we know ourselves and so on. Even when it's mock of battle, nobody will talk about friendly fire. This one thing that really shocks me when I, I hear about the war in the Middle East, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the rest. The NATO soldiers, a lot of times, lose and they are killed by friendly fire. This doesn't happen in movements. True movements, you know yourself even in the smoke of battle. Finally, the movement moving is the issue I started from. You recognize your success when you are moving. If you are stationary, you're not going to get anywhere, not even by time travel. If you're looking for ultimate victory in a short while, the struggle is going to dry out. So in life for a movement, even though it's not a journey in perpetuity, it's a, it's a long journey. It must be recognized that it's important to move. Moving, moving is the thing that makes history. Moving itself is a story. It's a cultural activity. Just keeping moving is what keeps you alive. When you stop moving, the blood in you stops moving, because I think you will have come to the end of the road. And so for a social movement that is going to really be active, alive and, and working, the basic ingredient is that you must keep moving. Not like Johnny Walker. Have you seen the advance? But keep moving. Moving is what keeps the imagination alive. It's what, it's what helps you to see new things. In my village, one of the things I learned as a child is that it's a person that travels who gets to see a white lizard. I'm yet to see a white lizard, I'm looking for it. But you see, movement is very vital in our fight to save the global community. So thank you for your attention. because people is um, feeling something, okay. and um, he also uh, says about the finance, the food, climate change, that are the main pattern that drives people to act, to be more compromised, to take an engagement. Uh, he talked also about that pollution is political, because he said this plant, this caution, that is also a very interesting topic. And um, he said that the goal of the movement is justice. Uh, it must be flexible, like politics. Uh, it must be built on alliances. And uh, the movement must have to uh, make key demands. And it must also be very inclusive uh, to unite people and to have a character. I think those topics are very important. And uh, he made a very big statement asking by stopping the crude production. I think this is a big um, statement made here. So then I will ask people to, um, to ask questions, to comment. And we have like uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes to ask questions and comment. The floor is open. But don't fall into it. <laughs> okay, right. Thanks for the interesting topic. Uh, but I have a question. Can the movement, if it's achieved its goal, to change the goal toward another strategy or another thing to achieve it? If it's focusing for the environment, to focus for the uh, for another thing to do it uh, after it's achieved its goal? Okay, um, you, you're asking if a movement can have a number of objectives. So 
But if you achieve one, you still move on to another one. You can have new objective as you move on. Yes, clearly, that can happen. Uh, because you could begin as an, as an environmental movement and then end up as a political movement. You can begin from confronting one particular issue, uh, then you find that there are other issues that are more urgent than the ones that you started with. Oh yeah, that's, that's part of the point of being flexible and that is one of the key things about moving, being in motion. Uh, right. Uh, Jill have asked me to, uh, if somebody wants to intervene to, to present, to introduce himself, like uh, the country you are coming from or the institution you are coming from. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Raba. I'm from uh, Palestine, studying here in Germany, Erlang University. Maybe I can follow another question. Mm -hmm. Can also the movement participate in politics in order to achieve its goal by running the election and become as a parliament members or as a president uh, or prime minister? Then? <laughs> you know, that's a very interesting question because it's something that I have personally thought about a lot and that times have encouraged uh, activists to go into politics and because times, at times it's not easy to change things from the outside and when you're inside you can make things happen. But it's also been very instructive that even governments that have come out from social movements, still sometimes they end up entrenching the same challenges, especially with environmental issues that other governments have also created. I heard about a, a president in one of the Latin American countries who has social movements. They show me where in the capital money, capitalist what what do you call it? In the Manifesto written by Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> they show me where in the Communist Manifesto there's anything against extractivism. Well, of course, you don't go see anything against extractivism. And so you find radical governments, in life, especially in Latin America, like in Venezuela, in Ecuador, and to some extent in Bolivia, they are not able to handle the environmental issues, even when the Constitution. It's very environment friendly. So it's a big challenge if, if a movement has objective of getting political power, the movement also has to have a clarity about what can be achieved and what will not be achievable. I personally, my conviction right now at this point in time, because I'm, I'm working, I'm not stationary, is that the objective of a movement should not necessarily be to take over political power, but to take over the political structure. To, to change the entire scenario, to change the way people think, the way people relate to one another, the way people relate to, to the political structure, and that in the, to, to create real democracy, which is people having the sovereignty over everything in, the, in, their, in their territories. If that happens, I believe that the goal of a movement to bring about change will be achieved. If it's just to, to get a seat, I'm not talking about the photographs of yesterday. It's about getting a seat. Uh, <laughs> uh, that seat becomes very important. Then you're going to spend a lot, of, a lot of energy protecting that seat. And then the movements that help you to get to that seat, you have to begin to fight them. Uh, and so uh, capturing power is, you know, is, is a very tricky issue. So we, we need to grab power is important to take over to control of system, but not necessarily by becoming the, the political leader as an individual. Or if, you, if it's a group thing, beautiful. But what is really important is the fundamental ideas of what the movement wants to achieve and the decision to work at the grassroots level to make those changes visible and unchangeable. Thank you very much. We have to move to my colleague, uh, Edith. Yeah, I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. You said that uh, for a social movement, you need like a lot of outraged people say no, maybe not necessarily sharing a vision. What about experts? Does the movement need experts and expert knowledge? The movement is what? Does the movement need needs experts and expert 
knowledge? Oh. It's interesting for us, of course. Yes. You know, <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, I think virtually everybody in the movement is an expert in some ways. Uh, people are just, you know, the expertise at different levels. Uh, so, yes, we need people with skills and knowledge in special areas who would help to build up the ideas that we struggle about. Uh, you know, in the environmental movement, I find that. In many of the legal systems around the world, if you say your land is polluted, you have to prove what polluted the land. So you need the scientists to do all the tests, to do analysis, and so on. But I live on the land, I'll tell you the trees are not what they used to be, the air is not nice anymore. All these are also experiences that need to be recognized by the legal system. So we need to change the legal system to be less adversarial, but to respond to, to the way people feel are what. So we need experts, yes, at every level. Right. Um can you introduce yourself also? Nana, I'm from Ghana. Do movements only some positive goals? Particularly looking at it from the angle where people just continuously join movements without even knowing what is at stake. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I believe that the spontaneous join of movements. Um, it's very good, but in the long run, those who don't believe in what the movement stands for, get to know what it stands for, they will fall out of it. So those who will remain and who will come on over time will get to know exactly what the movement is about and what is to be achieved. So at the beginning, you really can't stop anybody from coming in. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, the first January movement, we actually against forest subsidy removal, forest subsidy removal in quotes, was people, people just knew one aspect of the struggle that, look, we have to reverse the price of petrol. But the ultimate demands, if the movement has persisted, we to change the system, to change the company structure, and to overhaul, to overthrow everything. And so people came on based on what they could identify. There were a lot of expectations, a lot of ideas, and that cannot really be stopped. In any movement, there will be, there will be people with different ideas and different expectations. But as the movement grows, those things will sort themselves out, and this is why the movement would, even in the anti-apartheid movement, there were different different kinds of people working on different different agendas. So we should not be discouraged when you see people coming in and then dropping away, or people questioning. The movement must be open to questioning. If you want to change the system, as you criticize the system, you must also be willing to be criticized. Right. Sorry, I would like to go back to the violence movement and I would like to ask again about in the light of the Arab uprising right now. Does the high level of repression from the state or the power holders justify the violence by the movement to use the violence the movement? Which movement is the violence? Who, who wanted to change the system? But the system has high, uh, using high level of repression against this movement. For, uh, like what's happening like in Syria right now. We have people, we have some movement, different movement. They're seeking regime change. In this case, what do you see? This, uh, this can justify the movement also to carry the weapons, to, to challenge the state by using also arms? You know, you know, you know what? <clears throat> Let me be frank with you. In every objective condition, People must decide for themselves what, what methods they're going to use. And I cannot decide what the Syrian people are going to do. Uh, in my everyday work, I support communities when they make up their mind what they want to do. I just, we sit down, we talk, we put the, our ideas on the table, we make up their mind what they want to do. People is not, somebody's not going to do a speaking Swahili, sometimes it's good to speak back in Swahili. You speak Swahili and you speak French and you don't understand French, you don't understand Swahili, then there's no communication, so I don't know. Uh, it's for the people to decide what the, what the best response is. Right. Um, yeah, well, it's me again. Um, <coughs> you've got really interesting ideas. Um, you have already mentioned that the, the movement of the boycott. Um, in case of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you know, there is a big movement for the boycott of Israeli academic and visually uh, goods as well. 
from your experience, how do you say, how do you see such kind of boycott campaigns of movements affect um, a non-violent solution or a non-violent movement towards the solution of Palestinian Israel conflict? You know, there is a, there there have been big military events in Palestine and Israel, bombs here, bombs there. Um, but no one talk about practical non-violent solutions or practical procedures to end this ongoing conflict. From your experience, how do you see such campaigns affect the, um, the, this kind of conflict? Um, there is an example for the boycott. You know, the South Africa they were successful on the such kind of campaign to end the crisis in there. Um, the other question was different about the media. We know the media is really important in any movement or any campaign. Um, I don't know if you have already used the media, uh, but in case you use the media, in what way did you, did you use the media, local media or international media for your, for your movement as a weapon, as a supporter for your ideas and thoughts, or how? Okay, thank you. Okay, but two questions very quickly. First one, boycott, very good. <coughs> boycott at national level, boycott at consumer level against particular things by the our countries. Very, very useful. In the case of Palestine, I think Palestine is a very, very rather complicated situation, especially with a nation that is split. Gaza is the, a gap between Gaza and the West Bank. <coughs> and you don't have... Um, Borders with very many friendly, you know, you know what I mean? There's a restriction about how you can get things in. Uh, so boycott against Israel, for example, or supporters of Israel can be useful. Can be useful, very, very useful. And I think there's some key um, economic measures that can be taken. But then you need bigger support at the United Nations, which is not possible at the moment because of the Constitution of the Security Council. So there are, there are a lot of challenges there, but the idea is generally very good. I'm using the media. Movement must be able to cultivate its own media and also create its own media, media uh, as well as use the available media. media. Uh, I think the one mo movement that really used the media very successfully is the Zapatista movement in Mexico. The, by the communicators of Commandant uh, Marcos, the stories, telling stories of, because people really need, is, the struggle is also cultural. I tell my people, look, militancy is good with the gun, but you need to fight also intellectually. So you need to produce songs, poems, stories, get captured the imagination of people and get the thing that people will remember for a long time. Not the one that you know, just happens once and then people run into the bush and they come out again. So using the media is very critical. In my experience, we, we, we actually have structured media trainings where we invite journalists, selected journalists on the Barbados Nation train twice a year, and we're moving from part, one part of the country to the other one. They may not know what we're doing, but the objective is to get people to see things from our, from our perspective, as well as to understand why we say what we are saying and what the basic issues are. So, because many, Many people do things wrongly because they don't know better than that. So information, get information out is very critical. At least to get information out in a way that people can remember it. And movement must have its own writers. People within the movement. Music, poetry, drama. Uh, these are things that the media will capture and people will come to watch and demand. If you ignore the media, I don't think any movement can move that, can go far without the media. Right, we have to now close this session, but I will ask uh, three uh, interventions like, uh, to close that uh, session. Uh, okay, you and then after you. Who else? Okay. Hi, thank you. My name is Monica. I'm from Colombia. And I was just wondering if a movement is always moving, <coughs> how important do you consider it is uh, for it to evaluate the past? Yes, I, I, I just wish I can, you know, the, the, the older I get, the more I speak. So <laughs> I try to give short answer, but I never succeed. <laughs> um, but let, let me use a cultural reply to that. 
when people say that the dancer never knows how well he dances unless somebody watches the back. It's when your back is moving that it tells you how well you dance. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we're from the same nation, the same ethnic nation. So you look at the back of the dancer, then you know whether the dancer is dancing. So the dancer can never say whether he's dancing well. So movement must have its own internal evaluators. And you are moving, you have to look back at the milestones when you pass it, take note of what are the landmarks and what are the issues. And if you don't keep on evaluating, then of course you're going to be, I don't think movement can succeed without being able to evaluate and strategize regularly. Right. That man? No, my questions are Okay. Hello. chunk of shit rise to the top. Uh, so the movement will also have the big chunks with the real bad guys coming up to the movement who have personal agenda and who do just using the people. This is why movement must insist on collegiate leadership, horizontal leadership, not, not vertical leadership. Um, so that nobody, although you may have icons that people will know the movement with, you know, um, for example, the imagination of what if we think about movements, people that are some iconic leaders, you think about historically, you think about Che Guevara, you think about Mandela, but the fact that in their own lives are with, as active participants in movements, they never really help themselves out when we see them. So we need to cultivate leaders who don't want to be at the front, but who just want to get things done. But it must be at a collective level where we build up heroes and of people standing out that way, then we start to create a lot of problems. And this manipulation we talk about, the power politics is strong, the divisions, the betrayals, and so on. These are all the challenges that we confront in the movement. So the movement is not idealistic, it's just as rough as outside world, just that the dream is to bring about a better system. But unfortunately, it's a system with human beings. We'll stop the session here, and I thank Now we move up to Dr. Wolfram Lauga. Uh, as I said in the beginning, 